we go. I tell this story quite often when I was researching for the original book, Prescott's Original Whiskey Row. You know, I didn't know what I was going to come up with. And uh, I was delighted, I guess you could say, every time I came across a nice little murder. And I found myself going, oh, God, thank you, God, for this. This is going to be great reading. And then I realized what I was thanking God for. Someone got murdered, you know, for... Uh, for my benefit, I guess, you know, everything, but then I'd repent, you know, and then I'd go, uh, God, anyway, uh, this is going to make for some great reading. It's amazing how people love to read about murder and mayhem, you know, and I do too, but uh, I thought I was going to have to wear a mask today, and a lot of you know I a little ditty before I, that I wrote about Whiskey Road before I start, and I thought I was actually going to be the uh, masked singer. You've seen that program, The Masked Singer. I watched it for about 10 minutes, then I went back to a Western, you know, or something, a good sports program. Here's my little ditty that I always start with. It goes, let's go down, take me down. Let's go down to Whiskey Road. Let's go down, take me down to where the wild at heart go. Oh, take me down, let's go down. Let's go down to Whiskey Road. Let's go down to where the wild stories grow. Oh, take me down, oh, take me down to Whiskey Row. That's the end of that. I just, you know, I figured it well, up. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my uh, topic is murder in the Diana Saloon, which occurred in 1869. And I'll start with a little history of the Diana Saloon, the setting. It starts with this man here, Albert Noyes. He was uh, a New Englander, like many, many Pocatonians, came to Prescott after going to the uh, California Gold Rush. He thought he could get rich like many people did. He went across, uh, all the way across the country, got there, and like many, didn't do so well. And he heard about the uh, new findings in the Central Arizona Highlands, uh, they were having great success there, so he thought he'd trek a bit east, and he was one of those that went that way, and uh, I don't know if he actually did any mining or not, he got there, uh, I don't know if he knew that before he started heading over, but uh, he got here and discovered there was something else going on there, and it was that they were going to build a town in the wilderness. And it was at the capital of the Arizona Territory, which was just newly established by Abraham Lincoln. And he saw an opportunity because you know they're going to have to build a capital. They're going to need buildings. Uh, they're going to need grocery stores, mercantile saloons, of course. They're going to need saloons, social hubs of the of the West. And his opportunity, he saw because there was a demand for it. It was going to be and so he and uh, George, Lount, George Lount was a, uh, actually a member of the party, and he decided to stick around to see what was going to happen with this new capital. You know, there was going to be at least some commerce. There's going to be some great demands for businesses and houses. Uh, lumber. Was so George Lount. I wanted to show this to you too. Olivia back in New England, you know, he, he wrote her, and he wrote her, certainly the chance of fortune and position are better here, and there was no aristocracy. There was no aristocracy because there wasn't even a town here yet. It was a very unique situation. So he and George Lount uh, went, uh, himself a couple of wagon and horses, and they went across the country, and they went to San Francisco, and uh, they bought themselves a sawmill. And they dragged it across the desert, across the mountains, and it was quite an arduous journey, a lot of trials. It took great to get it here. And he arrived, him and Lount, the force behind all this. But uh, toward the end of August, the beginning of September in 1864, the mill started arriving. And I don't know where he originally started, but they, they called it the Quartz Mountain Sawmill. Again, uh, the driving force behind it, although he had 
uh, partners, George Lamp, George Curtis, they were both members of the Walker Party. But he set up, eventually set up his um, sawmill, of the saw, sawmill, boy, that is blurry, isn't it? The act itself is blurry, but uh, he, and, he set up his sawmill, the Quartz Mountain Saw here, sawmill, right over here. I think I'm pointing in the right direction. Is that where the Mile High Middle School is? Toward, it was actually the time that the uh, corner of uh, uh, ran it. And he started putting out lumber. And it was so productive, he almost had a monopoly in the Arizona Territory. As you know, the capital went to Tucson in 1867, I think it was. And they actually used his, uh, you need me to do it? I'm not one of the, I could never stand behind a podium. I've always had to move, but uh, where was I? He set up his uh, sawmill on Granite Creek, uh, just on the base there, and his uh, business was so successful, even when the territorial capital moved to uh, Tucson, uh, they used Noyes' lumber to build the capital building there. He, there was a near monopoly. You've heard about Virgil Earp having a sawmill here. There, and uh, I don't even know. There's, I think it's blown out of proportion, but that's another subject altogether. But he was uh, about four years to be here. He was putting out a lot of lumber, and he decided to have his, this own little project, big project of his own. And he put out a report, a rumor, kind of, that he was going to build a 60 foot by 28 foot two story building, which is about 1,300 square feet. It was going to be like a building like this could have never seen. And he started stacking lumber on the corner where St. Michael's is now, uh, the corner, the southwest corner of Gurley and Montezuma. And people were excited because, you know, there was this rumor going around that it was going to be quite magnificent. And uh, he started putting up this great frame. And this was the minor. This is mammoth frame house is being rapidly constructed. It is now overshadowed every. There were challenges along the way. You notice what time of year he was building? The summer of 1866. You know what happens in the summer? Well, I heard it happens. You can't tell it by this past. Year. But it's monsoon season. And on August 14th, a uh, big gully wash, big storm, blew up with big winds, knocked over that thing entirely. And they arrived at the. the um, building site next day or whenever that night and they got right back to it and seven days later and more progress was being was made uh, some of the walls were being put up at August 31st it was a Sunday night another big set, and it entirely the miner reported that uh, Noyes and his crew came uh, the next morning this time they were really dejected the other thing that happened too was Creek was in flood. Like I told you, his his mill was right on Granite Creek, and it washed up. I mean, he lost about a thousand dollars. Doesn't sound like much, but uh, that would be for you and me today would be like uh, twenty thousand dollars or so. It was a it was a big loss, but they got back to it, and much to Prescott's pleasure and pride, their river pride, they pushing on, and by. October 1868, after overcoming those challenges, uh, his mammoth edifice was finished. The original plan for Noyes was that he was going to keep the building. The downstairs was going to be run by uh, Cal Jackson, who was a prominent Prescott figure. He actually played a part in building the, the Capitol building. And he had a saloon up the, down the street called Jackson and Tompkins. He was going to run the saloon portion. The upstairs of this building was going to be uh, used for fraternal organizations, civic organizations like the Odd Fellows and Masons. But uh, somewhere along down the line, he changed his mind. Is that me? Is that you? <laughs> uh, he decided to sell it. Andrew Moeller is another interesting fellow. You've seen Moeller Street. You know, it's named after him. He became quite the property magnate. Uh, 
there was a point where he had so many rental lots, he was making 22000 a month, which is extraordinary money at that time. Uh, but he, he was one of those. He came from Chambersburg, Pennsylvania, which you know where it is. And he came, same reason, came to get rich in California, the gold streams and the gold fields there, but he didn't have any success. Came to the Central Arizona Highlands looking for better luck. But his, uh, his success started when he became a bartender. His name's Andrew. They called him Doc for some reason, but he wasn't a doctor as far as I could tell. But he was a bartender. He became a bartender uh, at the uh, court saloon, which is another story in itself. But it was uh, where, you know, where fancy that is on Granite Street? That's where the Quartz Rock was. And uh, he became a bartender and very popular. And the Quartz Rock Saloon was the go-to place. Governor Goodwin and McCormick, Secretary McCormick, they'd go there and actually drink. Like I said, the saloons were the social hubs of the, uh, of the, the Wild West, the Old West. But he saved his money. I don't know if he had success somewhere else, but he uh, started uh, saving some money. He was able to buy the Quartz Rock Saloon, which was the go-to place at the time in 1867. And then he heard about this new building going up, and it was going to be a saloon. And I don't know if he convinced Noyes, but Noyes agreed to sell it to him. So it became known as Moeller's Building. And uh, I call him the father of Whiskey Row because I'll, I'll show you in a minute some, some pictures. But the Diana Saloon became the cornerstone for whiskey, what became Whiskey Row. That was the first saloon on Montezuma Street, and other saloons followed. So this is the, uh, you've probably seen this image before. It's pretty much accepted it's the oldest known image of Prescott. I have a friend that discovered one that he thinks is 1864, and I don't know if he's verified that or not, but I think this was 1869, shortly after the Diana Saloon was built. And I got my little laser pointer. There's the, uh, so you can see here's Granite Street. That there is probably the old Capitol building there. It became a brewery. And there's the Diana Saloon. You see, it's two stories. So the upstairs was used for the Masons and Odd Fellows. And down here is the, uh, was the Diana Saloon. But you notice there's empty lots here. The row is forming there. I think you can see some buildings over back behind the trees here. But this is an interesting image. I think it was taken up here where the Pioneer's home is now. I did a little close-up here so you get a better look at it. But you can see... It was very, very popular. It was the social center of the, of, of the territory, territory for that matter, but uh, Prescott for sure. You can see men gathered here in the front. It was always over, an overflowing business. But again, nothing, nothing right here. So as time went on, businesses went up on Montezuma Street, and by the 1870s, it looked like this. It almost feels like this big screen. I can walk right into it. But here's the Diana right here right here. You can see, again, it's, it's still very popular. Down here you can see a bunch of men gathered. By this time, the Cabinet Saloon uh, had been established and it was run by Dan Thord. It became kind of the go-to place. This became known as the old, old standby. The Cabinet Saloon was here, and the original Whiskey Row was actually from here to maybe here. And there's, you probably heard, you heard the thing where there was just one saloon after the other. That's not really true. It's more like it saloons dotted as it dotted the uh, area. And over time, it expanded. It became more than just what's here in Montezuma. It became an area. The whole block, the uh, 100 block, became known as part of Whiskey Row, the red light district and all that. And then Gurley, up and down Gurley, and then uh, up and down Montezuma. But uh, that's the way it looked uh, when, the by the, when the Earps were here, actually. But now we're going to get to the mayhem, the murder and mayhem. Uh, Drew and I, people ask me which one's murdered and which one's mayhem. His name comes first in the book, so he used to be murder, and I, I'm just mayhem. But this one was a murder. And I called this Whiskey Rose's first bloodiest night because Prescott had a, a reputation for some reason for being a tame town. And it did get tamed, but it had to be tamed. And there was a, there was a time when... The people, the good people of Prescott were worried about uh, the future of Prescott, even if it was going to last, because when 
uh, it lost its territorial capital status. There was a little bit of identity crisis, a little bit of loss of purpose. And it was right after that when violence and lawlessness started to occur throughout the town. And it was written about quite a bit. There were, uh, and behind it all, uh, it was always whiskey. Whiskey was always a problem. We wish whiskey wasn't here. Send all the whiskey to China, I read one report John Marion said. But uh, I call this Whiskey Rose first bloodiest night because it marked the beginning of when uh, this lawless began. And it, start, it was about 69 to maybe 72 or so, and I'll, I'll explain a little bit later how Prescott was tamed uh, very briefly. But I call this Whiskey First Bloodiest Night because headlines, you know, the next one that happened, that was the bloodiest night, and then another one that happened, that's the most dastardly deed uh, in Prescott. And this one was worse, and there was, they, they, they did get worse, and Drew knows that. But 11 months after Moeller bought the Diana, it was 4 o'clock in the morning. Uh, these guys had been drinking all night. September 20th, 1869. This was the first, uh, the bloodiest of the annals of, the, of this town. And, uh, you know, the town was only, it was going about barely five years old at that time. But uh, there had been another murder in a saloon in the Quartz Rocks, act, actually. And that happened when uh, some men were playing cards at a table. And uh, in walks this guy, George Crafts. He was a soldier at Fort Whipple. There was a man there named William Murray. It took me a little while time. His name is Bill Murray, you know, but this was a different guy. William Murray was sitting there playing cards, and Kraft just came in. He wanted to cause trouble, and Murray wasn't going to put up with it. He threw his cards down on the table and said, said something to him. Kraft drew a pistol, and uh, uh, Murray did not have a pistol, but just like you see in the Westerns, his friend over here did have one. He grabbed it, aimed and shot Misfire, nothing. Shot again, the pistol blew up in his hand. And then Kraft just uh, uh, put two bullets in uh, Murray's heart and he died immediately. The thing that stuck, stuck out for me in this article, <laughs> I, you, you interpret this one, okay? He was talking about the murder, the reporter, and he talked about, Kraft was kind of from a well-to-do family in California and he said, well, his family's not gonna be too happy about that, what, about this happening, but the last sentence in the report, it said, Murray leaves behind an interesting wife. <laughs> That's how it ended. I go, what are you thinking, buddy? <laughs> you don't see reports like that anymore. But uh, a lot of many of the patrons, a great bulk of the patrons of uh, the burgeoning Whiskey Row, took a little time to be named that, were soldiers from Fort Whipple. And Sometimes there was trouble, because where you have people and whiskey, eventually there's going to be trouble. And uh, Edmund Wells, who you may know, he was a very famous Prescottonian, influential, became a the Republican governor for uh, Republican candidate for governor when Arizona became a state. Whipple would actually send guards down uh, to the corners of what became Whiskey Row, Gurley and uh, Montezuma and then Goodwin and uh, Montezuma, and he'd post guards there to keep, you know, keep an eye on the soldiers. But apparently this night either they were uh, falling asleep or taken off duty. But that was, so great was the concern. And this one and all involved either active soldiers or discharged soldiers. So Sergeant Patrick McGovern, 8th Cavalry, he'd been shot. Private Thomas Donahue, 12th Infantry, Infantry he'd been shot. George Nunes, he got stabbed, Nunes, however you say it, he got a knife wound, and the accused were all soldiers. Uh, Private Harry Langham, he was still active. He was uh, one of the accused. Joseph Johnson and William Collins, they were both discharged, and I don't know if the discharge had anything to do with whatever this conflict was between the soldiers, if something weird had gone on, but uh, they were discharged. Langham, he was caught. I think maybe he was an active soldier. I think maybe he did his dirty deed and just gave himself, gave himself up. But he was arrested that morning. But Johnson and Collins took off. And the town was, uh, let me say this first. Uh, uh, so Johnson, it was claimed that he shot McGovern. And then Collins, exactly what he did, but he must have been seriously involved. He said he had abetted Johnson some way. But these guys took off, and Prescott was in, was in shock. 
uh, McGovern's unit, the eighth, uh, the eighth cavalry, took off after these students. They headed south toward the mountains and into the mountains. And Lieutenant William McLeese uh, was heading this little posse. As I said, the um, Prescott was shocked, and uh, this things have been building up in Prescott. There was bad stuff going on, and. Uh, it wrote, uh, this was the feeling of the Prescott people, is the prayer of the entire community that they will be killed or captured. The prayer, they were praying for that. So, McCleaves takes his 8th Cavalry and he stops at Fort McDowell. He does a very smart thing. It was, if you've re done some reading, the influence, the difference Apache Indian scouts made was, was huge. And he picked up some Pima Indian scouts. They were uh, very skilled trackers. And but this really paid off, and they headed down. Head, I keep thinking, all I can see was heading down the I-10 after him, but you know it wasn't there at the time. But he heads south toward the little Gila River and near the Sacaton Station, where it used to be a Butterfield Overland Mail route a stop along the way. They were trapped and caught, and they were bound, taken prisoner. And McCleave and Hayes tailing gave credit to the Pima Scouts. He, they made the difference. We might not have got them without the, the Pima Scouts. They went back up to Port McDowell. They dropped off the prisoners, and they the Pima Scouts stayed there as well. And I don't know if they had some kind of a, a arrangement to be get paid, but they surfaced later. And then uh, D.A. Kane he brings the, the prisoners up to Yavapai County, and then. Ten days later, uh, I think it was a week later, there was a stir in the town. Indians were here, you know, and that was a lot for um, unrest because, you know, you, you know, I don't have to tell you. They were a little worried, but they were there to collect their pay, you know, so they got their, got their pay and they, they, they went back to wherever they were. And it seemed like everything was set, you know, we're going to uh, uh, try these guys, convict them, maybe execute them, send them off to prison somewhere, but... It didn't stop there. Somehow, the friends of Johnson and Collins got them, snuck in, sneaked, which one is it? Snuck, sneaked the auger and a saw to these guys, and they were able to hide it. Uh, one night, John Taylor was maybe making his rounds. He closed up. I don't know if he left the night guard there. If he didn't, he should have. If the night guard was there, he fell asleep. But they were able to drill out a section in the jail of the the log section, so big they were able to climb out, and they escaped with an ease that troubled locals. You know, things were getting lawless. We catch the criminals, and then they escaped. Things weren't good. Taylor put out, he must have been a little embarrassed, I think, $300 more for the six-foot black-eyed Johnson. $300 was between five and $6,000 at the time, what would be for us. $200 for the shorter, blue-eyed, light-skinned Collins. But guess what? They were never caught. They should have got those Pima scouts uh, to help them again. But I, I don't know. It, it just, they just disappeared from print. So I don't, I don't know what happened to them. But uh, like I said, this was when uh, Prescott was going through a little crisis, identity crisis. And eventually they had this idea, let's get a night watchman to patrol Whiskey Row. And uh, that made a difference. The guy's name was William Jennings. He was like a one-man army. And he kept things rather tamer anyway. There's quite a few incidents. With, it's in the book. And eventually a guy named James Dotson uh, took over. And he was a village marshal and a chief of police. And he made a huge difference. He, um, he's someone I've, I've sent articles to True West and Tombstone Epitaph because I think this guy should be... Uh, amongst the legends, the, the Hickoks and the Earps and all those guys. But uh, yeah, uh, Prescott wasn't as tame as it uh, led on to be. And to let you know a little more about that, I'm going to hand it over to Mr. Mayhem. Thank you very much, by the way. What do you say we go up and sap this guy and take his car, one man said to the other. I don't know why we couldn't get away with it. He just lives in that car. Originally, they hired the driver to bring in some bootleg whiskey into Prescott for the frontier days in 1922. 
They kept talking and talking, eventually planning to waylay the driver and steal his car. It was about 1 p.m. when the illicit errand was completed, and the two men, along with the driver, turned off onto the midnight test mine road and parked about two miles short of the mine itself. Using some contrived excuse, one of the men convinced the driver to walk up the road with him where they talked for a moment. When the driver turned and started walking back to, toward his car, the companion struck him over the head with a blackjack. The driver fell to the ground and murmured a couple of words, and that just brought a couple of more blows from the blackjack. Is he dead, the accomplice said? Yes, was the reply. But just to make sure, one of the men took a knife and stabbed him in the chest, the driver in the chest a couple of times to be sure. They rifled through his pockets and stole several personal items before they dragged the body to a cliff and threw it into the canyon below. Well, there's just one thing to do, the accomplice said, and that is to get away. He would later confess to police that when they arrived back in Prescott, he was nervous, half drunk, and in the damnedest fix in the world. 25 hours later, the driver was found by a hiker and he was taken to Fort Whipple Hospital and an investigation immediately ensued. Although mystery still surrounded his identity, the extent of his injuries were now apparent. In addition to the bruising and the cuts from the fall down the canyon, it appeared he'd been beaten around the head and face and stabbed twice, just missing the heart, but piercing one of his lungs. It was the work of an astute journal minor reporter who actually found out the identity of the man. He found a prescription amongst his belongings that was made out to a man named Ivor Eng. And the reporter went to the personnel man at Fort Whipple and, and another person at Fort Whipple to ask if the, they could identify this person who was in the hospital. And they said that it looked like Ivor Eng, but they couldn't be so sure because his face was so horribly beaten. Well, finally, after a couple of days, the man recovered just enough to barely whisper his name through his swollen lips, and it was indeed Ivor Eng. Eng had been an orchard worker and was living in his car down in Phoenix. He was making some money driving people to different places, an old-time kind of Uber thing, I guess. And uh, before that, he worked at Fort Whipple, but he came down with tuberculosis and had to resign that position. There he is. Uh, by the way, William Acker is no uh, uh, relation to J.S. Acker, who we have our, uh, our Acker night and so forth. And uh, this man was one of the men who was last seen with Ivor Eng. Ivor was able to finally speak one clue, and it was Reef Hotel, and the police went there and found that he was supposed to meet uh, Bill Acker there. Well, meanwhile, Enge's car was found wrecked in the town of Maricopa, and law enforcement connected it to Acker and another unknown man who was there. However, when Eng was asked about Bill Acker in the mysterious drive to the midnight test mine road, he couldn't recall any of the details at all. Acker was eventually trailed from Phoenix to Los Angeles and arrested while in a restaurant there July 2nd. Once in custody, he denied taking part in the assault, but admitted to the robbery. He was charged with highway robbery and grand larceny and was detained. At first, Acker claimed that he didn't know the accomplice in the car, and he later gave a false name trying to protect him, but the police finally got it out of him, and the man who was with him was named William Berg. Acker 
then was taken to the hospital bed where Eng was for a dramatic identification. When Acker first arrived, Eng recognized him, gave a faint smile, and put his hand out to offer to shake the man Acker's hand. Well, Acker, he trembled, drew white, and almost collapsed, but he recovered and accepted the proffered hand, according to the paper. Well, when Burge was finally uh, located and arrested, a number of Eng's personal belongings were found on Berg. Although Berg denied that he had ever known Eng, it was found that both Berg and Eng had lived in the same, or rather worked in the same building at Fort Whipple. Well, the two were brought together eventually in the uh, county jail, and when they saw each other, they at first kind of feigned recognizing each other. But uh, when Berg was ushered out of the room, Acker said, well, you needn't look any further. That's the man. Both were denied bail. And several weeks after the attack, it was decided to try to perform surgery on Eng to try to remove uh, some pressure on his brain, hoping that it would uh, get him to be able to speak better. But unfortunately, the surgery failed, and he died five days later, having suffered this terrible ordeal for over a month. Acker was taken from his cell to a lonely shack where Eng's body had been laid out on a rough table. Acker was forced into the room with the corpse and a light thrown upon the body. Why, why that's Eng, Acker said. This was the way Acker first found out about Eng's death, and he knew he was in a tough pickle at this point. The charges were changed from highway robbery and assault to first degree murder. As Acker's trial began, it was difficult to fill the juror's box due to the prosecution's efforts to bring the death penalty into the case. During the trial, Acker and his defense never swayed from their original confession, saying that he was just a witness to the mur murder, and it was Burge who actually did the killing. However, most damaging to Acker's case was prosecution witness R.C. Ragsdale of Phoenix, who testified that Acker confessed to him that not only was he present when Eng was attacked and fatally injured, but he himself, Acker, administrated the blows that caused Eng's death. When prosecuting attorney John L. Sullivan made his final argument for the death penalty, Acker sat with a half smile playing over his lips and when the jury walked out of the box to begin their deliberations, he laughed, the paper reported. When a verdict of guilty carrying the death penalty was returned, he received the announcement of the jury foreman apparently unmoved. He was later sentenced to hang December 1st. While investigating Enge's estate, it was soon apparent that he lived out of his car out of choice. It soon proved that the poor man was far more mis misfortunate than destitute. He was found to have $10,000 and squirreled around in different banks, which is about $155,000 today, which was a surprise because when he was ill, uh, the local citizenry of Prescott were trying to get money together to pay for his hospital bill. They had no idea he had that much money squirreled away. Attention then drew to the trial of Thomas Burge. The prosecution's case consisted of a parade of witnesses who testified to Eng's ownership of several items that were found in Berg's possession. Witnesses also testified that the alleged murder weapon, the blackjack, was sold to Berg a few days before the attack. The defense opened their case with Berg testifying in his own behalf. 
He admitted that he had met Acker and traveled with him the day after the alleged crime, but completely denied that he had met Enge or had any knowledge of the assault. Ooh, I'm getting ahead of myself there. Sorry about that. He described his whereabouts on the day of the murder in minute detail, and this was eventually corroborated by two witnesses uh, giving his whereabouts in town instead of on the mining road. And eventually, he was indeed found not guilty, and his sister, who lived in Louisiana, was here, and his two sons from Los Angeles, and they celebrated, and his kids came up and gave him a rough hug and said they were going to take their daddy back to Louisiana and there would be no more trouble. Well, in light of Bird getting off with it, the appetite for the death penalty for Acker really melted away, and people began to want his sentence to be commuted to life. His parents, Acker's parents, lived in Texas, and they came to Prescott and Yavapai County to try to save their son from the gallows, and they ended up spending their life savings to keep him alive, and they really weren't even able to stick around in Prescott to see what would happen because they just ran out of money. They had no place to go or, or to have money to be lodged, so they had to take off and end up going back to Texas before any of this actually uh, came to light. Well, after interviewing Acker, the board decided to sign a recommendation to Governor Hunt suggesting leniency. They were convinced that Acker was guilty of first-degree murder, but they were moved by the citizen's outcry to save his life. And indeed, uh, members of the jury came up to talk to the parole board and the judge who sentences, sentenced him to death also wanted to have it commuted to life. And indeed, uh, that's what was happened. They told Hunt, give him leniency, and for, for Hunt, it was an easy decision. When he first took office as the first governor of the state of Arizona, one of the first things he did was commute a number of life sentences. So uh, this was no problem for him to do. After receiving the news emotionally, Acker's first request was to send a telegram to his parents informing them that his life was saved. Acker, overjoyed at expressing thankfulness, became so unsteady that he was unable to eat his evening meal, the paper reported. Now sentenced to life in prison, Acker settled into a job as a main hall chef due it is to his past experience at Fort Whipple. His crime was the first homicidal carjacking in Prescott history. Well, I have to quote or till? You got uh, 10 minutes. 10 minutes, okay. <laughs> All righty, well, that's good. My, uh, the next uh, story I'd like to tell you involves a murder plot at the Pioneer Home. This took place around 1919, excuse me. <coughs> For attorney A.J. Baker, it seemed a routine chore. He had made out several wills and testaments before. The only difference this time was that the elderly client representing, requested rather, the lawyer to come down to the street and where he could meet him at a car for the signing. Baker left his office with two copies of the will and handed it to a paralytic Pioneer's Home resident named William DeBeau. He, it would leave a nurse at the Pioneer Home by the name of Clarence Dyer all of DeBose's worldly possessions upon his death. It was Dyer who accompanied the elderly man to Baker's office. And when the wills were presented to the client, he signed them by making an X with his left hand. The document was witnessed by Baker and the legal work was paid for with two $5 bills. 
It was at that moment that Under Sheriff Ed Bowers suddenly charged to the vehicle and leveled a large six-shooter directly at the aged man's chest. Throw up your hands, Bauer demanded. Clarence Dyer, the would-be beneficiary, was a new employee at the Arizona Pioneers' home. He had been a stateside army nurse drafted into the service during World War I. The reason for Dyer's arrival was the Spanish influenza pandemic and the resulting fatal pneumonia. The last quarter of 1918 alone brought over 2,000 deaths to Arizona from the malady. It took the quarantining of whole towns and the cancellation of public events before the disease was arrested. Of course, healthcare workers enjoyed no such precaution and fatalities in that field were quite acute. As a result, the Army released a number of its nurses and orderlies who had been drafted into the service to finish their service by working in various state institutions that were suffering from manpower shortages. Dyer was a part of this program. He enjoyed his new job and the unique facility that employed him. He did his work well and seemed to get along with both the residents and his co-workers, one of which was named Carrier Thompson. Thompson was thought of highly. The home superintendent described him as an extremely efficient nurse and, in fact, knew nearly as well as any doctor would on how to take care of people. Thompson quickly bef befriended the new arrival Dyer, but their conversation soon turned nefarious. First, they concocted a scheme to steal some army-issued blankets that the re one resident owned. They would store them in Dyer's quarters, sell them, and then split the profit. They thought that since Dyer had just come from the army, he could provide a plausible explanation if they were found. However, before they could carry out their plot, the blankets were moved to a secure location. So the pair turned their attention to a different prize. This time it involved the emptying of a recently deceased resident's bank account. Thompson, they tried to forge a check, but the plan, this plan failed as well because the bank became suspicious, held the check, and did not honor it. Well, despite this unfortunate luck in these uh, criminal enterprises, they would not be stopped, and the two started planning an even larger haul. It was Thompson, as usual, who hatched the scheme. He knew that one of the residents, William Dubow, had the equivalent of 18 months' pay squirreled away in the bank. Thompson's plan was to forge a will, giving the estate to Dyer, and then Thompson would poison Dubow and the two malfeasants would split up the estate. Their first plot involved petty theft, the second involved forgery, but now they were planning premeditated murder and the implications, the implications caused them to begin to act a little suspiciously. Soon County Attorney Neil Clark was made aware of the situation and he came up with his own trap. First, he secretly made a thorough three-hour search of Thompson's quarters. It revealed several stolen items, but no poison. So to be safe, Clark made preparations through local officials to tr keep track of any poison that was sold uh, in the Prescott area drugstores. Debeau himself, the patient at the home, he was kept in the dark about the situation because they were concerned about how this would, would affect his health. Yet Debeau had already become suspicious of Thompson's behavior and was worried considerably and considered about asking for help when this trap was sprung. So when the under sheriff told the old man to throw up his hands, he knew that the old man could do so despite his claim of paralysis because he knew he was pointing a gun not at Debo, 
but at Carrier Thompson. A subsequent search of Thompson's quarters finally revealed a 60 cc bottle, three quarters full of chlorodyne pills, it was reported. This is the poison that Thompson had intended to use, but upon being informed of Thompson's arrest, DeBow was relieved, very cheerful. I feel better than I have for weeks and I intend to live a long time, he said. To his credit, Thompson always stuck with the story he told police immediately after that he was arrested, although it proved to be utterly implausible. He blamed Dyer, stating that Dyer had gotten a woman pregnant and in order to marry her, he had to prove to her family that he had some means to support her. Thompson stated that Dyer approached him with the idea of forging the will, showing it to the girl's family and then burning it. At trial, Thompson's story was corroborated by no one. Dyer's account, however, was corroborated by the superintendent of the Pioneer's home, law enforcement, and the county attorney's office itself, for it was Dyer who had informed the superintendent about the blankets and the forged check and the murder plot. It did not take long for the jury to find Thompson guilty. Although he had won a chance at retrial, the testimony and the outcome remained the same. So, realizing his ambition to work in state institutions, the newspaper quipped, Carrier Thompson was left in charge of the sheriff where to be taken to Florence where he would serve a term of 10 to 14 years. Thompson would never be heard of in Prescott again, while D Dyer decided to become a permanent resident of the city, and he continued his profession as a well-respected and highly trusted caregiver. And he was uh, well-respected indeed. Should I cut it off there? Okay, all righty. Well, there was one other story that I was going to talk about here. That was the dynamite attack of J.S. Acker. However, I did write about that in uh, days past, week before last, so you can read about it there. It's available at, on the website charlottehallmuseum.org. It's been a pleasure to talk to you, and we hope we can do it again soon. Thank you very much.